What's up, big dog? What's up, dude? How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's cool that you're broadcasting from the moon. That's uh, that's, that's the yeah. So I usually sit on the other side of the table and like give me the fucking moon on the back. So this time, that's how big Barstool got is you guys got a flag on the moon. <laughs> that's now. our mantra, man, is take it to the moon. So maybe, maybe, maybe I'm just trying to get there ahead of time. <laughs> well, unfortunately for you, I am a moon conspiracy theorist. Oh, so never landed on let's it. Let's just it's fucking dive right into it then because it's it's the hologram and you're a sheep. I, it's one of the things that like, I've spoken to an astronaut who quote unquote landed on the moon. I did yeah. an interview with him and I was like, what would, what would you have to say to someone who hypothetically maybe didn't believe in the land in the moon landing? And he was like, I would say you're an idiot. And I was like, okay, but also what would you say to actually prove it? And he goes, well, there's a lot of like rocks and stuff in, in a, uh, um, a museum in like Houston. And I was like, that's your fucking answer buddy yeah. i mean it just doesn't I mean, make sense like logically and i'm not even trying to be funny because i know it's like kind of a zany conspiracy theory but just given the technology that exists now versus then and seeing some of the things we still struggle with today the fact that they sure, landed sure. on the moon is just it's far-fetched i least. am i walk into every every conspiracy theory everything in life being like i am dumb enough to probably be wrong that's like my that's where that's my starting point is yes. like am i wrong for this anything in and life so they, i walk into anything so if going, they were to like i'm dumb enough yeah and i and i and i've been saying this all through covid it's like if they prove covid was a hoax you, you got me you <laughs> got me if kennedy was shot you got me if the moon landing was a hoax you got me I don't know. The Sandy Hook's the only one where I'm like, well, there's footage. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, that's a weird I draw the one line there. Like, I am not a, fucking with the kids. That's where I draw the line. Everything else, though, on the table. Conspiracy theorists have to, like, that's got to be an interesting sub-community of all of them interacting and, like, I wonder what the tiers are or levels of, like, do the moon people look down on the JFK people or are the JFK people the top of the conspiracy theory? Right. Like, no, I want to know the inner workings. There should be like, I'm a professional wrestling fan. There should be like a heavyweight champion of conspiracy theories. Like, like, like Kennedy then, might be the intercontinental. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. 9-11, maybe the US champ, you know, <laughs> just give, and then like Sandy like Hook, because you're like, dude, that's like a hardcore match. That's just like a tax <laughs> match. They're just doing that just to fucking, they're just going to break a bunch of light bulbs on each other and act like it's uh, wrestling. Dude, speaking of wrestling, if I love you brought that up. I since I've started this job and we've gotten big enough, uh, and we'll talk all about your career. We're gonna get into everything on this interview, but since we've been lucky enough to get uh, a lot of like bigger names, I have been on a crusade to find someone in the industry who will say something bad or tell me a story about Dwayne the Rock Johnson that is unbecoming. Yeah. Because it feels like, you know, he's just Mr. Perfect in every way. And then it feels like in recent years, sure. this with the Behind the Mat documentary where they talk about the infamous match with him and Mankind, where he just beat the fucking yeah. hell out of his head with like an unagreed upon amount of chair shots. And like his kids were crying and he was just like, you know, it, it, it seemed every wrestler agrees he went over the line it feels like i finally found my story that the rock has done something bad and nobody really seems to care wrestling fans yeah, dude, kind of I talk don't... about it but nobody talks about the time that the rock almost killed mick foley well he worked stiff that's you know he just had a <laughs> he worked stiff with mick and you know i knew there i could i'll find a way to just completely take the rock side i'm like i mean he's the brahma bull what do you want Kevin? <laughs> come on Kevin. i don't know what to tell you my, my argument in favor of him in that situation is is not even to do with him it's to do with mick foley it's like well he was it's man yeah, i mean i had to hit him yeah, 14 mick, times it's mankind yeah mick like you know mankind and cactus jack and dude love like he would just really take a shit ton of abuse that guy was because if you look at him he doesn't have the body and then when you meet him you're like oh you're the nicest guy in the world in the world in, in the, the world, world. he yeah. when he started doing stand-up um was like 2010 right like 2010 2011 and i used to do all the i used to do a lot of shows at broadway comedy club or in the cafe next door like me nate bargetzi joe list mark norman and like occasionally samaril Giannis papas 
we would mm -hmm. all do this uh this guy aaron haber had a room that was all tourists barked in from Times square and the whole show were the people that barked them in and usually like nate and i or list and nate or Giannis and i you'd have two pros that would be on the show right so it was a nightmare. I was gonna <laughs> say, <laughs> what a shit show with that. I, I I have bombed so hard in that room, and it's crazy to watch. Um, you were at Nate Bargetti's uh, New York Comedy Festival show at Town Hall. Yeah. Oh yeah. So was I. Unbelievable. Crazy to think that two avenues away, I used to watch him in a Vandy shirt and glasses just fucking bomb in front of a bunch of Finnish people being like and it was like fun to watch Nate get a hold of that because like watching Nate learn how to tame that has made him why he's one of the best guys working right now yeah because yeah. he, he used to do this thing we'd be like oh I don't know am I are y'all do you not understand my accent and he would just like but it would be I mean Kevin I'm telling you dead silent dead silent in the room and Nate which is would, almost oh. impossible for me to to believe because like I'm such a fan of him and yeah. where he's gotten to that it's like there's no way there's ever been a time where someone wasn't laughing at <laughs> yeah. Nate Bargatze, you know? dude that's what's crazy to watch I'm so happy for him and like all my friends that have done well but you just think back to like I can think back to like 07 to 2011 and a lot of the guys that are doing well watching them bomb just we've all watched each other bomb yeah that's why it's that's the, it's that's the, the comedy yeah that's the comedy locker room we've all right. seen each other's leaders cold in water <laughs> 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 Well, they're like, yeah, dude, I saw you after a hard loss. You know? Right, and then right. Just like, yeah, but look at me now. And you're like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> That's why when everyone's like, great job, I'm like, shut up. You've watched me bomb. And Broadway, I used to fucking eat it all the time. So the reason I bring up Broadway is it was a blizzard, and I used to uh, wait tables at Dos Caminos. So I go home to Dos Caminos. I like change into my regular clothes. I get back on the train. It's a blizzard. I'm like, dude, this probably isn't going to fucking, this show isn't going to happen. Right. And I walk through the snow from the train, from the station to the, to the comedy club. And I walk in and the manager's like, Hey, um, sorry, you're going to be, you have to go later. Uh, Mick Foley's on stage. And I'm like, what? What? <laughs> what? And I, like I had a fever dream. Like, is this yeah, dude. real life? Yeah. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I walked in and I was like, Mick Foley. And the manager doesn't know I'm a wrestling fan. And I was just like, wait, can I watch? And she yeah. was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, cool. And I just sat in the back of the room, you know, where all of us bombed. And he did really well. And he was like, because, you know, he's been in, he's been cutting promos for 20 years. Sure. So he's comfortable on stage. But it was, uh, it was interesting to watch because he was, he does storytelling and he's, he's funny about it. But uh, afterwards I met him and I was like, man, what a surreal thing to be said to. Like, yeah, you're bummed. Sorry, dude. Or, or dude, yeah. love. Cactus Jack. Yeah. Bang, bang. Sorry, dude, Diamond, Diamond Dallas Page is doing a drop-in set. You know, <laughs> uh, fucking chill out. I think it's cool, though, to think that, like, you you did comedy and, and grew up as a wrestling fan. He does wrestling and probably grew up as a comedy fan. And it's a weird world, both worlds, where I feel like it can kind of collide in the middle. Where Yeah, we're both obviously we're both carnival acts right yeah like obviously yeah. there's this physical elements of wrestling that you don't have but the rest of it is kind of cutting promos and it is mic work and it is like look at me the dancing monkey who needs validation right yeah it's a weird <laughs> thing because growing up i loved wrestling and then like you get to high school and everyone's like it's fake and gay and you're like <laughs> uh, yeah i know but like i love it i still <laughs> like, kind of like it, it. Yeah, I love yeah. it. And I loved it. And this was like all the way through the attitude era. And then when I got to college and my, and my drinking problem kicked in, I just was like, I didn't have, you know, I wasn't watching. I was thinking I'd watch raw once in a while, but I wasn't watching SmackDown or anything. Right. And then when I moved to New York and finally moved into my apartment in Queens, my roommate who I'd known forever was like, Oh, we got to get cable. And that was when DVRs were new. Mm -hmm. And he was like, it's DVR Raw and SmackDown. And I was like, oh, fuck, I'm back in. Get back in. So yeah. I got back in yeah. it. And that mixed with the fact that I met so many comics in comedy that were just like, dude, I fucking love wrestling. wrestling. Like, love it. Like, Mike Lawrence, Dan St. Germain, Michael Che, Jermaine Fowler, Sal Volcano. There's like guys that were like, we go, you know, Scott Chaplin. There's, uh, there's a bunch of people that are just super into it. They're like, oh man, this is awesome. We can all be real big fucking nerds together. Yeah, man. It's like, it's like Ron Funches. <laughs> Ron, yeah, yeah. Well, Ron, sorry. Ron, Fun I just don't want to forget this. Ron Funches had the funniest line. We went to a wrestling pay per view. We went to the first AEW event and we were all backstage 
stage and Jim Ross walked by and we all got quiet and Ron Funches just goes, man, we're fucking dorks. <laughs> <He> goes, <laughs> we just got quiet. He goes, we just got quiet. Like the president was walking by. Was he so was though. He's funny. that dude. He's Bro, that guy. Yeah. What the hell are you, sir? How if you, you, if you grew up with it and you enjoy it, it's like the, in my mind, the, yeah. the attitude era is the most entertaining thing that has ever happened. It was wild. Talking television, I'm talking movies, comedy. If I have to pick one thing that entertained me the most in my entire life, the Attitude Era. It had yeah. it all. Drugs, sex, it, violence, all of it. If anyone was like, what was the Attitude Era like? You're like, uh, live, Inst it was like if Instagram was a TV show. Yeah, right. It just had before, everything. Yes. Drama, shit talking, uh, half naked people. Yeah. Like, it was fucking wild. <laughs> but it's... It's also one of those things, man, where I know as a wrestling fan, if you don't like it, psh, no problem with me, man. Fine. I don't know why. But also, on the same note, you want to talk shit about it, I probably can find something that you like that is super fucking dorky. And that's what I mean. Like, especially if, if any girls ever give you a hard time for it, it's like, I mean, do we have to go to the roster of shit that you watch? It's reality. It's our version of reality TV. It's yeah. our, you know. It's it, it's friends. Real Housewives. It's our yeah. Real Housewives. It's, it's trashy stuff that is, you know, the most entertaining thing that you can think of for that your week. Don't, exactly and but leave I'm it alone leave me the fuck alone you know? but <laughs> I, I think that's the thing that's the problem with a lot that we're having in i think uh entertainment is everyone there's so many options that now instead of telling people what to like you're people are telling people what to not like not like yeah why you shouldn't like what you do like and you're like okay all right Who cares just fucking do my dad used to have this phrase one of the only things my dad that i learned from my dad was he used to never say he hated shit or didn't like it. He would just simply say, I don't care for it. Mm -hmm. It was a very like a subtle way of being like, fuck off. I'm not going to tell you how much I don't like it. Or I just, it's not for me. It's such right. a quick, like, nah, I don't care for it. Honestly, I think if that was, I would take that as a cutting but honest criticism if someone was like, do you like Dan Soder's stand up? And it's like, ah, I don't care I don't for care it. For it. Like, you know what? It's fair. Good luck. <laughs> Check out Mark Norman, Joe List. I don't think I'd be mad. Whereas, whereas someone is like, fucking not funny. You're like, all right, now I think you're a fucking idiot. Yeah, now but I got to defend this. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'll, but let it, me tell you why, but you don't care. Whoops. You know, it's like- You want to knock, you want to- If you, you tell me you don't like down, something, if, if, if you don't like how this tastes, I can't change your fucking tongue. I don't, you know, it's just, yeah. whatever. I don't care for it. Yeah, <laughs> like it's that. that, sorry, man. But if someone's like, I don't care for it, like, that's fair enough. God bless you, sir. You, you know what? I'm, I might start saying that about the moon landing. Yeah, I, just, I don't care for I don't, it. I don't care for it. I don't care I don't for care. You, the Apollo missions. I, I don't, don't think care. it happened. I don't care us leaving the earth. I'm not a fan of it. So wait, why we never actually answered like what what's your official like what's the, the clincher where you really feel like it was totally impossible for that to happen? Just for what? what? Why don't what's your main reason you don't believe the moon landing happened? Oh, um, basically similar to what you were saying, like where we were in the 80s where you see what technology used to be and you're like did you guys just like sling a guy onto a rock and uh, and, and i think that's like mostly that. probably what it was but yeah i guess so and that's why if it did happen no it's one. the most badass thing that's ever happened but they sent you into orbit to link up with this thing to link up with that thing to slingshot around this crap you know it's all fuck no way Make no mis make I don't I don't want to anyone make a mistake about this. I respect all astronauts. Anyone that's willing to go through that training and have that kind of uh, intelligence to get to space. That being said, old school astronauts were like old school NFL players. Oh yeah, it was like, dude, you're doing this for the love of science. Yeah, you are getting <laughs> exploration. You're getting zero help with a rubber hel or a leather helmet or those old seventy one bar down face masks like. You're smashing into a guy with plastic on your head. Right. These guys were just getting slingshotted into space. And for and what? Like, you know, yeah. it's like just because I have a, I feel like a calling because we have to. NFL go there. quarterbacks have a command center in their helmet now. <laughs> and like fucking Fran Tarkington had to be like, I'm just going to run away from that guy and hope another guy in purple is somewhere near me. <laughs> and it's like, you fucking, those astronauts are the same way. They're like, they're looking around like, you guys have coordinates and stuff. We had to do a math problem to see where we might they land on that. Paper rock. and pen for fuck's sake. It's crazy that Apollo 13 was the only one that fucked up. Like, it's pretty impressive and, that it and, wasn't. And you know what else really makes me question it? Is that, we, what was, I think it was like 2003 or maybe even later that we had another like horrific 
crash with the discovery, I think it was. Okay, if we're still blowing up in the 2000s, there's no way we made it to the moon in the 60s. There, and everyone, you know, with things going on right now, everyone's doing a lot of like the where are you aliens? They're like, You think we're gonna fuck with you at all? You you kind of know we're alive, right? You you kind of know that we're around. They aliens, they would hit us with the don't care for it. Yeah, the Earth don't care for it. Why there. would you? Fucking why would you, dude? Uh, you know, we were in another dimension. We watched a lot of it. They just seem <laughs> to be uh, angry little monkeys that are figuring out their little pocket computers. Dude, dude, it's ugly, man. It's crossed over to even, like, I don't even... I, I, I used to kind of secretly think, like, well, at least for you know the shit to talk about and there's, like, material and content, if you will, and now it's just like, oh, man, I, this is all... It's all terrible. It's not even, there's no, there's not even a silver lining. Yeah, man. I mean, you're seeing what happens when life shuts, shuts down and we have to reflect on ourselves and, uh, yeah, no, dude, there's a reason that there are like nine billionaires and we're all, and we're all filled with anxiety. There is a fucking direct reason for that. And it's just, man, you like, if, if no one took the time, like the pandemic is a terrifying time. Uh, and for some a fucking way 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 harder time than most a lot of people lost a lot of shit um you know good on i just fucking saw good on you guys for that uh helping the restaurant workers crazy man something like 20 yeah i gotta million. i gotta yeah i gotta donate after this because that was you know literally one of my first thoughts was like man i am so fucking fortunate to be in the position i'm in because if this would have happened in 20 in 2009 when like i'm describing we're at broadway I would have been fucked, man. Fucked, yeah. I had like $200 in my bank account and I was living off maybe 500 a week doing stand up, trying to pick up random gigs. So it's like, man, there's a lot of people that are really fucking hurt. But if you're not hurting or if you got the bills taken care of and you're kind of just bored, you better fucking start working on yourself. Seriously, that now's the time. time. <laughs> now's the fucking Dude, I have a, I have this reflection beard. <laughs> like I fucking, <laughs> I, I fucking, I'm going, but it, you know, it's like all the things that, uh, it's just been a, a great time, I think, for me to, you know, living with my girlfriend and my dog. It's mm-hmm. just been unbelievable. Are, can, can we talk about your girlfriend? Sure, you yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Because, because I mean, I feel like it's been, it's it, it was it weird for you to like uh for people to be like interested in your relationship i feel like when you and Katie yeah, got man. together it was like it's like in our world in the blog and comedy world it was a little bit of like a celebrity couple yeah which is both of us were just like why does anybody care yeah why Dude, does I, 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 care? I i googled you real quick just to see what's going on before i go into this yeah. and the and this happened to me as well with all my personal shit the first thing that like auto fills is like Dan Dan Soder girlfriend Dan Soder Katie Nolan. It's like oh, <laughs> not not your comedy, not your yeah. career, not what you've worked on. Just who? Why is he? He's banging that girl. Let me talk about yeah. it. Let me find out about it. Oh yeah, we um, it's it, it's a weird thing I think to have, especially being a comedian. I was always very um, kind of aware of keeping my personal life personal. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm like jokes that I have on old specials and even all my specials. Like I never name people, Mm -hmm. you know, I never would even give a first name or anything, even on the bonfire. I I would. A girl or a girl I was dating or whatever. No, no, no. I would say, you know, an ex or I was dating a girl be like, Oh, well, my girlfriend, it would just move into, because really it's like, people are too quick to give everything away to everybody. Mm, I know I was bro. I mean, I, I, I didn't do it in a way that was like, I, you know, I'm going to put this out there because people care. I was just like, we, I was doing it at a point where the barstool was still small. And I was just like, I don't know, this is my life. Let me tell you about it. Here's her name. And here's my, and then I had kids. I was like, yeah, I'm having kids. And like, I just, I just put it out there. But then when she hit the fan, it was like, oh boy, I wish I kept all of this private. Yeah, man. I think, um, I think there's a lot to be said about, uh, about keeping part of you out of the light because, uh, like I like, not I liked not knowing things about the people I grew up, you know, uh, taking in their shit, whether it be comedy, music or whatever. And now in today's culture, it's really people have capitalized on it and made a lot of money with like reality TV and everything where they're just like, oh, come take over my life. Come and look at my life. And, you know, I do the bonfire with Jay eight hours a week. And that is a lot. That's a lot to let people in and and let them kind of know about my life. But it's Jay. It's one of my best friends who's one of the funniest people on the planet. Right. And it's our crew. And so we're just having fun and, and joking around. And, 
you know, Katie was someone that I met doing her podcast and then doing her show when we were, we were buddies. And then it just all of a sudden was like, oh yeah, we've been in love the whole time. Holy <laughs> shit. This is crazy. Which is kind of like the best, the best way it can go down. I feel like if you I find mean, that shit. you're happy, right? I've said it to her several times, man. Uh, I was very fortunate to be in this situation with her because uh, someone that I just find so fucking funny and fun to hang out with and just like a great person. And so it was weird when everyone finds out about it. You're like, man, fuck you guys. This that is my like, secret. Yeah. yeah. This yeah. is us. This is for right. us. And, and it wasn't like, you know, I don't think it was a big deal. It was just kind of like a weird thing for a couple of days. You're how just like, how did, did people see you together? And then like, it just leaked or was there like, a... I don't know. My manager called me. It was like, page six is going to run something about you and Katie. And I was like, why is that was that literally nuts my, when I was you, like, guys there's a lot more going on than yeah just, um, i i mean that know. at least that was a positive thing like when i had when i went through my divorce and it was all public i had page six oh, daily my. daily mail oh, fucking Jesus. bro i was in people Man, i was in oh. people Man, and i'm I, like and i actually it was like all the assholes here were like Hey, bro, like at least you made People Magazine. Like, you yeah. know, you made it to the big time. And yeah, I was like, you guys yeah. are assholes. But Dude, I could your mom's not. Gonna be, my mom's going to be reading about you taking a dump. It, exactly. <laughs> and I was like, I cannot believe that people think I am worth, you know, their time or interest. It's like, holy shit. But that's also like the, that's um, what I've learned about all that is like, it's the, it's the different side of the same coin it's the same as like people knowing you and, and knowing who you are and loving your shit and you know putting you over which is always great mm -hmm. sometimes that that that's obviously going to come at a cost mm -hmm. and that is you have to give up some of your privacy in your life and kind of stuff that you would be protected by and i mean i'm friends with people that have gone through way worse shit i mean shane ari i've seen people go through some fucking situations where you're like wow right like the you know the and, and for them to get through it, I've watched Katie go through situations like that where I'm like, damn, like I'm fucking, I don't know if I'd put myself even out there to get involved in that much of a situation. I, yeah. I'm talking about not in hers, but like with, with Shane's, it was just like, he just got canceled. They just came for him. Ari did it to himself. Right. So there, I'm talking about three, all very, very different situations. Point being is I've seen people go through kind of what you went through and we got a small taste of it of them announcing our relationship. That ain't fucking shit. But it was still like, oh, damn, this is invasive. And it's is weird that, like, no matter what, it still comes down to what people are going to be most, like, primarily interested in is, like, your love life, your sex life, yeah. with, if you're breaking up, if you're together, whatever it is, that still moves. I mean, sex sells, and that still moves the needle as far as what Yeah, salacious salacious shit always is going to fucking sell and you know mm. obviously if it bleeds it leads is the reason we're in all this shit because all right. the fucking all the media all the news media loves to just be like it's fucking raining blood yep. and uh it's it it's a weird thing to be in because you're i don't know man it's it's understandable because i think people people can interact with everyone so much now that i think sometimes people just want their humanity checked they just want to be like, hey, you're a person. I'm a person too. And I I go through this. And I yeah. think that's like the best thing that Jay and I can provide for people is just like, hey, we're just two guys getting stoned watching YouTube videos and news stories that we've watched. And probably some of this is going to be wrong. And it's been a savior. You know, we're finding a new home at Sirius XM right now. But from the for the pandemic and having this like – Stand-up was always the way that I kind of just filtered everything. I was just like, oh, man, if I feel like this, I can go talk about it. And if people laugh at it, a lot of times that's like there's empathy in that laugh because they understand. So it was like this thing Late, so yeah. being shut off from that. You're kind of in this weird position where you're like, fuck, man. Well, my humor was always used. I, I developed my sense of humor because I was in very uncomfortable situations growing up that the only way to get through it was like, hey, let's just fucking make fun of this, huh? Mm -hmm. This is fucking, I think that's who I'd be on the guy. You know, if I was on the Titanic, I'd just be the guy that's like, fucking, I shouldn't have taken this job. Or yeah, just, right. Just something right. like, I'd be bitching to the guy to the right of me, like, women and children first, am I right? <laughs> yeah, like, that's exactly, because that's who my kind of, that was my dad's attitude. And that's kind of like, I see a lot of that in myself of like, when shit hits the fan, sometimes you're just broken down. To, if you're not freaking out, you're kind of like, well, what are we fucking doing here? Yeah, man, you, I mean, you went through it. Like you, your father, your family, you lost a couple people. And like, do you think that you became, uh, 
I I'm I'm gonna joke my way through it because yeah. it, because it happened, or do you think like you were already that way? And I think I was a silly kid. I was like a really silly kid, and I just liked being silly and like I was obsessed with The Simpsons and like doing voices, which I would be canceled for now. Oh man, you I mean, so that's I mean that's interesting too though. It's like you can do those voices, but. Do you think yeah, that's so a little like so nature versus nurture? Were you watching those shows and trying to do it? Or you think you're yeah, man. Have the talent to do that? Man, I made my dad pop with, uh, I, get, I did, I made all my friends at school pop with like my Apu, uh -huh. which from the Simpsons, which was just like the first voice that I could even kind of do. And I was like, oh, that was fun. And then when I learned how to do like a Rodney Dangerfield, my dad was like, that's right, fucking kid. funny. Yeah. Like, when, my dad, I just remember, but like, yeah, it was like a thing of like, oh, this is fun. This is fun to make people laugh. I liked getting in, like I could get, if I got in trouble in school, sent out to the hallway for a good joke, I was like, well, you know, what Mission we accomplished. Doing? That was a yeah. win. Yeah, absolutely. And when you can make someone like your dad laugh in that setting, when that, it, that's to me, that is like when your older brother or your dad or someone you've looked up to is like, wow, you are the one entertaining me. I, I wish I could do what you could do. It's like, whoa, holy shit. I mean, that's always been the thing, I think, for all comics is when you have an older comic be like, that's a really funny joke. And you're like, what? Wow. <laughs> you're yeah. like, yeah. huh? Like a tell hit me with that when I first got past the cellar, like oh, that homeless uh, drinking joke's really funny. And I was like, pass that. Thank you. It tells the one, right? I mean, every time I've talked to you guys over the last however many years, all the comics I talked to, he a tell is like the comics comic. Yeah. A tell and Colin Quinn. And, and Patrice, of course, right? Everybody. Yeah, well, I mean, we're, yeah, we're going living. living yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I Let was, me, can I just quickly ask a, com a question about Patrice? Yeah. And it might sound disrespectful, but like, is he as good as as it's? Yeah. Yeah, he, it's not like, yeah. it's not one of those, like, you know, he he's a, guarded because he died. It's like, he really was that dude, huh? Yeah, comics have um, a gravity to them. Mm -hmm. Like, like, a, like, like, how good a comic is is how how much do they suck you in and you just want to listen to them talk like mm -hmm. how much is their gravity and like Chappelle's got a gravity that's I think the best where you just li you can listen to him I've, I've watched him at, at the cellar for three hours right it's not even joking necessarily it's just like talk. He's just talking here you go yeah uh Big J's got that gravity Big time, um yeah. Michael Che's got that gravity I've seen uh, I've seen guys that just have it that can just sit and kind of toy with it. Patrice was like another level. Like I used to, uh, I wasn't friends with Patrice. I think I, I you know, spoke to him three times in passing. Um, one of the times, one of the times we were walking in the cellar and I was with Joe List. Joe List had kind of knew Patrice and it was like Joe List, me, Norman and someone else. And we were walking to the cellar and we were, we're, none of us were past there. And Patrice was leaving and he just goes, What's up, Joe? Uh, Patrice <laughs> Joe goes, What's up, Patrice? And Patrice goes, What's up, Joe? And he's like walking out and he goes, I don't want to meet any of your goofy friends. <laughs> like, ah, yeah. All right, sorry, Patrice. <laughs> but he um, but yeah, man, he like Bill Burr and Patrice O'Neill to me are the two like comics that went from like I went from it's hard to explain because like I grew up loving Chappelle and George Carlin and Ronnie Dangerfield and you like watch all these guys and you like love all their stuff. And then you start getting more into comedy and you start listening to Stanhope and, and Hedberg and you start going to like Geraldo and you start for me, it was like Opie and Anthony blew open that door for me. And I learned about Burr and Patrice and, you know, learned more about, I mean, I love Jim Norton. Jim Norton's one of the guys that I would say was one of my favorite comics for a while. And it was just cool to be able to get to know him, but yeah. And it's like, you start finding your way, you know, and you start watching Bill Hicks and mm -hmm. you start watching like old Richard Pryor. I always hated when I heard comics be like, I remember being 11 years old and watching Richard Pryor. It's like, motherfucker, you like Robin Williams, like the yeah. rest of us. Get out of here. Dana Carvey's Critics' Choice is one of the most influential specials of my life. 1995 HBO special hit me right at the right age. I was obsessed with Dana Carvey. That special to this day means more to me than like, Zeppelin 2. It's like, yeah, right. Zeppelin 2 is cool. Fucking Dana, Dana Carvey, Critics' Choice, HBO special. David Spade's Take the Hit, which I learned about later in life. I missed that one when I was young. All those become like these like iconic albums and shit. But then when you get to New York and you see the people making the sausage, you're like, oh shit. Oh yeah. shit. Like Dave Attell's the greatest. Right. Greg Giraldo. You watched, you know, Bill Burr just moved to LA when I moved to New York, but he would come back and have these sets and you'd be like, Jesus fucking Christ. Patrice, 
it was just like watching guys like that. You'd be like, oh man. And then you'd go to Creek in the Cave or you'd go bomb at Ochi's Lounge and just fucking eat it or Broadway and just fucking tank. And then, yeah, like I remember one time Nate and I went and saw, it was at New York Comedy, uh, the New York Comedy Festival, Burr headlined Town Hall. Nate and I went and saw him murder. And then we left, walked through Times Square Nate went and did a spot at Broadway and I took the train uptown to go do a check spot at fucking stand up New York. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy. It's like, man, now Nate did town hall. Yep. Same theater all for a New York comedy festival. I, you know, it was nuts. I put out a HBO special right at that time. Yeah, like, man. I mean, me. you, you list all these other people, but I feel like you're that for me. And I got it. I, I kind of got into comedy like a little bit later in life, but when I first met you, probably, I, I probably, I mean, I guess maybe it was billions, like, esque time when I also realized, like, you're doing comedy. I don't, I don't remember the exact timeline of it. Yeah. But when you talk about, like, the gravity that certain comics have, I also think about just the pure funny that some guys have. And I think that you're, you're probably my number one. Oh, man, that means like, a lot. Thanks, like, man. I, the first time we did a show together at, or whatever it was, I was just like, that dude has fucking fun. Funny. And I don't know uh, about the the the, uh, the crafting of jokes and all the all that shit the way like you would, but as pure as far as pure funny, where it's like you're not even trying, you're just having a conversation. I feel like yeah. the Stefano has it as well. Guys, yeah. it's just like I'm going to laugh every fucking time I talk to them. You're at the top of that list. Man, that means a lot, and uh, I really do appreciate that. And it was something that Joe List said that to me one time back when we were drinking, and it really fucking blew my mind. He was like. We're friends with the funniest people on the planet. On and the I was planet. Like, like the top 0, he's 0, like, 0, 1%. I was like, like who have ever lived? He's like, I, I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, we're friends with guys like Colin Quinn and David Tell, who are the best New York comics. In New York, I, you know, I can make an argument we produce better flat out stand up comedians than LA. Anyway, yeah. I mean, Burr was a New York guy that went to LA. Mm -hmm. LA has produced some fucking monsters. I'm just saying, I think on average, the New York guys hit harder mm -hmm. and have better jokes. And I think there's a reason for that is because that's what makes you stronger. When you go in and I see that Sam Morrill has put out two fucking specials in quarantine mm -hmm. and I put out a 15 minute set on Colin Quinn's show that I was like sweating about. I'm like, I just don't know this fucking joke. And then this, and then Sam's like, <laughs> I saw him just the other night. He did like one of these, you know, fucking social distance outdoor things. Yeah. And I texted him and I was like, yo, I'm coming through tonight. And he was like, bro, it's going to suck. I'm, I'm working out all new material. Like, don't get your hopes up. And he's, you know, he was doing kind of, he stood there with the paper and was just working them out. They were like the funniest fucking jokes I've yeah. ever heard. I was like, fuck it's, you, Sam. Man, it's like seeing, I saw Sean Patton at uh, the Village Underground. We did a show on New Year's Day and I got to watch Sean Patton close out the show. And he had like three bits that made me feel like it was 07 again and we were doing the open mic at the creek and i was like oh i don't i shouldn't do stand up yeah. i shouldn't do stand up this is fucking crazy this is crazy this that bit so got and it's like i'm excited for all that to return mm -hmm. and come back but what has been great is like having the ability to have the bonfire because that that like pure funny thing for me became um i, I guess i want to say like kind of a blessing that all my friends that I that I surround myself with I truly think are like just the funniest like I just you're, just, I you're to constantly have, surrounded by it I mean it's awesome yeah, but I get to, just like I get to go is... I like I get to talk with Jay Big Jay who is I think one of the funniest human beings has ever walked the planet maybe like the I best truly, storyteller you know ever but just off the cuff just yeah. shit that he can pull out of literal thin air yeah. is just the fun like references and shit he's just he's like fucking the way his brain works is you're like, God damn, you're one of the funniest people. And like, I'll talk to Shane, who is, I mean, hilarious. Shane Gillis is, you know, I met him. He was hosting for me at Helium on like New Year's. And after the Thursday show, we just played Madden. And I was like, yo, this guy fucking rules. Yeah. And then he was <laughs> hanging out. And then like a month into it, he's like, yeah, I got to tell you something. I was at your special taping in Philly. Like it was a bad thing. I'm like, yeah, I don't care. He's like, this is weird because I came to special taping. I'm like, yeah, that's great. But then like to watch him come to New York and everyone be like, this guy's fucking hilarious. You're like, I know. Oh, Same I with, told, yeah, yeah. With Nate, with like Nate, like knowing how funny Nate and List and Michelle Wolf are just seeing people be like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. And that's what like, 
that's what I miss is like watching my friends and myself kind of keep churning out new bits and like getting jealous of bits and getting jealous of like, fuck man, I wish I had that angle. I want that. That's the take. Like, you know, Louie was the king of that. Louie would come in and just have a take and you're like, oh yeah, he's one of the greatest of all time. Like that's, I mean, it's undeniable. Like uh, that, the, the, the latest special he put out, I remember oh, loved it. being like, we'll see, you know, we'll see how this goes. Like, is it, you know, is it going to be the same? Is it, can you still laugh at him and all this shit? And I was like, oh, that was maybe the funniest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, man. He's, you know, um, iconic. Like Louis CK was. And, and, and was proof positive that there's something almost like a sport where it's like, yeah, you know, that guy had some off the field problems, but when he swings a bat or throws a yeah. ball or shoots a basket, like it's unfucking deniable. Hey, uh, Elvis Presley married a 14 year old. So why don't we fucking chill out chill, on TK? Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. right. <laughs> uh, let it, you know, it's, it's, um, Louis was a guy that, you know, we were talking about kind of like working on yourself, I guess. What a fucking dumb, basic bitch sentence to use. But you know what? It's a little, it's mature too. You get a little bit older and you start to think maybe I actually should fucking not try to be a piece of shit all the time and maybe be yeah. a little bit better of a, of a person here while I'm alive. But it's other stuff too, man. Like I, you know, I will admit one of my insecurities in up until recently was like, you want all those guys I named, you want them to be like, you're the funniest. You know, when you start right. comedy, you want the fucking Doug Stanhopes and the Louis CKs and and the you know David Tells to be like, you're the greatest thing that's ever picked up a mic. Cause you think they're the greatest thing that ever picked up a mic. So you yeah. want that kind of like th thing. And so for comedy for like years, I was watching like almost as like a, a large, uh, drawn out uh practical joke. They were like, my heroes would come and love my best friends. So like <laughs> Burr would come to like Caroline's and see Nate and be like, I'm telling you, yeah. you're one of the fucking greatest comedians of all time. You're the fucking best Nate Bargetzi. And then like Chappelle was like, ah, Michelle Wolf. She's the funniest girl I've ever seen in my life. I love her. I love her. You know, like Chappelle's the reason I do comedy. And then Louis like becomes best friends with Joe List. And I'm just like, dude, do I suck? <laughs> do I fucking suck? I mean, fuck? dude, that I... Yes, it has to probably feel like if that's the case, like always the bridesmaid, never the bride. But like you, that to me blows my fucking mind because again, you're that guy for me where it's like, I can't imagine anybody wouldn't single you out right away. But that's also like, that was something that I was learning that I was like, dude, you are fucking focusing on the wrong things. Yep. You're focusing on, because then I fucking am texting with a tell or talking to Colin Quinn and they're like, hey, you're fucking that new bit. And you're like, oh man, I need to shut the fuck up. Right, I right. To, and, and I think that's like something that I was, really focuses and I was like, why do I give a shit about stupid shit like that? And I think our brains do that naturally with all the technology we have. When there's a serious issue, we can focus on it. But if not, we need to focus on something. Mm, so it's like, true. you're focused on the wrong I, shit a lot of the time. I also think it's only totally natural to like want that validation, want that approval, that cosign. I mean, I yeah. do it with every podcast. Why am I not ranked higher? Why don't I get that guest? For sure. Why do they, you know, why, 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 why? And it's, it, I, 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 I once, I saw an interview with a dude from train who was like, I wasted so much of my life and career just focusing on why am I not Coldplay? Why am yeah. I not Chris Martin? We do the same sort of shit, same sort yeah. of music. Why him and not me? And then he finally just kind of let it go and was like, maybe I'm not, but dude. I'm, but I'm also pretty fucking good. I got a good thing going. <laughs> the, the thought of a guy being angry and then writing pussy music like that is <laughs> no. so funny where he's like fucking British. God damn shit. it. Yeah. And he goes, she's got the loveliest eyes in the world. He's like, I'm going to fucking kill him, dude. <laughs> the scientist. What kind of bullshit is that? I want to touch your hair. I want to lay it down. I'm going to fucking break shit. Give me more whiskey. <laughs> you never think about those guys having those Everybody's things. doing it, man. Everybody's got those thoughts, dude. But that's the that's the thing about this whole fucking pandemic that i really thought about and it, it's like that's why i really do appreciate your compliment is because i think i'm at this stage now where i'm like man i just want to be funny i just yeah. want to go be funny i'm gonna say words that are probably gonna hurt some people's feelings i don't mean to i'm my intention is always trying to be funny and let's just i don't need to be on the cover of people Right. Just let's fucking sell some comedy club tickets and have fun. And everyone, let's uh, try to feel better for a little bit. Do you still feel like, uh, like when you got billions and then, and then bonfire is more of just like a radio thing, 
you know, you're, you're also a different comic in the sense you have very diversified. It's like not just comedy. It's not just stand up. You've got a lot going for you in different like avenues and different mediums and shit. But you still like stand up and being on stage is still the the thing. I mean, stand up's always going to be the thing. Yeah. Stand up. But, but you realize that to be like, that's my thing. But also I have a fucking major role on a hit show. And also I have a daily radio show that, you know. Yeah, but it, it's interesting, man, because what I love about Bonfire fans is they know me. Like my, the Bonfire fans know who I am as a person mm -hmm. and how I am around my friends. And they kind of know, you know, they know I'm zero to 60 on stupid shit and I misread situations. They know I'm fucking, you know, they know a lot of shit about me. You know, they know about my mom and, and just random. They know I could be Lake County Dan with one decision of a judge. And so it's just stuff that it's like, man, they know me. And Billions is just an unbelievable opportunity that I got because my friend thought I might be good on the show. You know, Brian Koppelman, I've known since 07. And it was never a thing of like, hey, you want to put me in one of your pictures? He just, <laughs> he, you know, grew up in New York City, loved stand-up comedy his whole life, did stand-up comedy. That's how I met him. And it was just like this guy that loves comedy. That's why you see Mike Birbiglia and Sam Marill and Alan Havey in Billions. Yeah, is because right. it's like, you know, he's auditioned a ton of comedians for Billions. And it was just a, a thing where I was lucky enough that they had me come in for a role. They liked me, but I wasn't right for the role. And they're like, hey, we're going to kind of need this guy in the fucking Axe Capital pit, kind of a loud mouth. What about Soder? And I came in and like one of the other guys on the show, Nathan, is an unbelievable actor. And he just got a bunch of stuff. And they were like, you want a couple of his lines? <laughs> you know, you're like, sure, fuck it, right. why not, man? Right. And then it's a weird situation because I'm not an actor. I am trying to act and trying to learn how to act, but I would never consider myself like, that's how I feel about people who come into comedy from something else. It's like, I don't care if you're a professional wrestler and then you're a stand-up comedian. Do you respect stand-up comedy? Mm -hmm. I don't care what you did before this. Are you doing this as a grift? Or are you doing this as a fucking real profession? Do like, you care? Do you care and about so, like, if they get like that, a bump? What's that? Do you care though if they come in and kind of like because of their background get more opportunities than the next guy who's been doing it his whole life? No, man. Theo Vaughn worked his fucking ass off. Mm -hmm. Theo Vaughn started, a, and and I love Theo. And mm -hmm. Theo came in from the road rules, and dude, he came. This is a real story. I swear to God, I started comedy in Tucson, Arizona, at Laughs, um, and the owner Scotty Goff had Theo featuring and Theo was just off the road rules or whatever. And I was just this local guy and I was like, fucking road rules. You're gonna let him go. Up. You know, I'm just like yeah, one of these yeah. desert fucking rats. It's just like, you're gonna let him fucking go. Up. I'm fucking doing open mics. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, and I did a guest set and then he went up and, and then after I talked to him and he was such a nice guy that I was like, wait, why do I have this? And then I've watched him. That was fucking 2004. Yeah. So that was 16 years ago maybe it might have been 2005 so it's like that dude has worked for 15 years so absolutely not if you're going to do stand-up and you do it the rest of your life i got no qualms with you at all but if you're mm -hmm. coming in this to collect a check and then fucking get out of it i have zero respect for you right you know it's like this there's such a I, what is it that about comedy is it like that there is such a grind and a struggle and like you do have those times we have 200 dollars in your bank account where like you guys protect the fuck out of that craft i think more that's than where we're, that's where we're similar to wrestlers yeah <laughs> it's yeah, like I always, gotta, gotta, whenever i see someone breaking the code of comedy i go watch that dr dr dave slap jim uh what's you know that one where he's like is wrestling fake and he slaps him he's like is that fake yeah. and he slaps him again he's like is that fake that's how i feel <laughs> listen man we can be comedians can be overexposed there's stand-up was so popular in the last 10 years that we are headed I've been talking to Katie about this for a while. We're headed for our grunge phase. Okay. Like right now, what you are living through is the end of the hair metal stage of stand up comedy. Okay. It's just I like, like that. I'm telling you what it is, but they're just wiggling their butts and like <laughs> licking a guitar. And we're headed for fucking gray weather and fucking sad. So, but like good shit. Like yeah. get ready. We're headed for quality. Yeah. yeah. But you're going to see quality like. You go back and you listen to a Nirvana song. It's a good song. Mm -hmm. They're a good band. They weren't just like a fucking, uh, I don't, a, like a, a genre band. Right. It was like all those bands were actually really good. I'm like- it's Transcendent, getting, yeah. Yeah, man, and obviously it's our age and how we grew up. And like, obviously that was super popular when I was a kid, but I'm just saying, 
I think we're kind of headed towards this phase where like people are done. The, people know the tricks of social media now. Yeah. Now we know the hey guys, swipe up, right. smash that like button. It's like right. you, man. I, no offense to anyone that does it, but you'll probably never see me on Cameo. You won't right. see me being wishing your friend Rob a happy birthday. Right. No right. offense to your friend Rob. God it's, bless him. It's, it's the, uh, I, I did it recently when I was just like, <clears throat> Christmas is coming. We got to buy presents. We got bills yeah. to pay. It's the uh, internet, you, whether you're a comic, a blogger, whatever. It's our version of panhandling. I feel like I'm on the corner yep. being like, please, sir, please give me some money, please. <laughs> Dude, I don't want to resent a guy because I took 40 bucks off his friend to wish him a good luck on his surgery. Like, I don't want to fucking be this guy that's like, <laughs> hey, Mitch, Ron tells me yeah. that you just lost your dad. Just want to Bro, say let me tell you the maddest I've ever Ever been in my fucking life because i i do this i just rattle through them whatever it, i do i i do put like some effort into it but it's really let's be honest i'm just trying to make some extra cash and this one dude uh i didn't even know you could do this he gave me like one star and oh. was like and was like pretty good like mispronounced the name and oh. like got his age wrong or something and i was like if i could find that person right now i would kill you with my bare hands <laughs> let me tell you what that does that eliminates the awkwardness of uh, in-person meet. Yeah. When you yeah. meet someone, you should feel the cold water around your chest. Right. You shouldn't be like, be and second of all, he walked up weird. He didn't slap the handshake that I wanted on. He fucking got weird. It's like, dude, I don't want that with us. Like I'm telling right. like, if you like my comedy, fucking stick around. I hope I make better shit coming up. Right. If you don't like my comedy, go check out so many people. Right. We don't have to do this thing where I have to be like, I am funny. Right. It's like, Please like me. I'm going to show yeah. you why. But also, I'm not here to tell you that I'm giving you, and you know, I'm not providing anything besides right. my stupid, silly thoughts. Like this whole idea that comedians, I really, re like, it fucking irked me hearing so many comics. And I, I've definitely been guilty of this in the past. But when we suck our own dicks, I think people are just over it. They're just over us being I, like. I can tell you from you know fan point of view, it is kind of like they are over it. Where you're like, let me tell you what's really going on. I get in there and I take a punchline and I just I bend it and I. It's like, dude, shut the fuck up. I don't yeah. know. My dog. I saw dog shit fall out of my dog's asshole. Weird. I want to talk about that. <laughs> I bet you do that funny. That is a good joke. Yeah, but it's like, I don't, yeah. dude, I am a not, fucking, You're not curing cancer. You're not. Yeah. And, and this isn't a knock on me as a person, but it's a, just to let you know where I'm coming from. I'm a fucking loser. <laughs> like, I am a loser. Don't think I'm ever going to be like. And also another thing, bro, I will try to friend, like give you a friendly nudge in the right direction. If you're being a fucking cocksucker, you know, I'll right. be like, hey, maybe don't be such a dick. But it's like, I think but, but also you have to realize from from our point of view from this like fan in the audience point of view it's the furthest thing from just like you're the average you're just an average dude you're just a loser it might be like oh i know that he we came from the same background or cut from the same cloth but when you can do what you do and be on stage and all that shit and when you're when you i mean it, it is almost godlike in a way in those no, moments man, it is, no, no, it is. No, it, no, for us not, it's like it's that's why a, these guys are like, we put you up that way because it's nah. like it's the you guys fucking are, most you guys are making thing. it's your fault for our fucking our, definitely you know, stop sure. making stop making idiot kings yeah it's, that's it's really just, what it is just and you know what else? Hand. What it's else a trick. Is You're being carny, dude. You guys, there's no bearded lady. There's the, no the, bearded lady. There's the a man guys, the stand-ups, the comics getting into the internet is funny too, where it's like this revolutionary idea to be on the internet and do social media and YouTube and shit. It's like, uh, we're all fucking doing it, guys. We're yeah, all everyone's all... doing it, but there are people that are doing it very well. Oh, well, uh, sure, very well, better, Andrew, no doubt. Andrew. Andrew Schultz, Schultz did kid, a yeah. fucking phenomenal job of doing that. And but even Tim that, that's Dillon what I mean. It's like we're, we're, you know, from our point of view, it's like, yeah, we've been fucking grinding away on the internet here at Barstool for fucking two decades, just trying yeah, to make our, sure. our bones that way, you know? Yeah, and so I, I bet you see the same frustration that a lot of comedians are seeing where we're just seeing people just come in that aren't comedians that haven't put in the work. And they're just, you know, when you benefit off like that, hey, I'm fine with you benefiting off it but you better fucking acknowledge that you know you're skipping the line. Right. And if right. you don't, 
Well, then that's when I'm going to start to, if you're like up front, you're like, dude, I fucking suck. I fucking cut, whatever. Have you ever had Ben cut in line? That's how it feels. You want the person who cuts you in line to be like, sorry, guys, my fucking buddy was waiting. And then you'd be like, hey, dude, no It's all problem. good. You acknowledge whatever. it. Yes. You know what's going on here. Yeah. It's the fucking acknowledgement. Right. Just acknowledge it. Acknowledge why you suck and people will like you. I yeah. promise you that. Yeah, because you can't expect them not to take the fucking skip if they have, if Yo, they man. can, but you got to at least be like, my bad. Yeah. And this was, that was a real thing that I struggled with. And, you know, I talk about wanting like the older comics to like me and shit and wanting that. But my problem in general that I've had to work on in therapy is wanting people to like me just because of the way I grew up. I grew up completely alone as an only child. You know, I mean, I had an older sister, but she was 12 years older living in LA and I was in Denver or Aurora. And it's like, I was just completely alone. My mom worked full time. Dad was out of the picture. And you just get this like weird thing where you're like, you can talk yourself into being like, I think everyone hates me. <laughs> like, real quick too. real fucking, quick it can happen yeah and as a kid that can be a formative thought where you're like yo i think everyone fucking hates me and then you just spend your adult life being like do you like me and they're like yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you and believe it, in that like uh like comics have to come from a place of trauma and use all that to, to i think or the best helps. ones do yeah yeah I think, I mean, Will Ferrell is one of the funniest human beings of all time. And from all accounts, like he had a pretty good life. But I know, it, people, it, I know people from pretty good lives that are really funny, but I know some people that straight up have became great people from absolute darkness. Luis J. Gomez came from one of the hardest lives I've ever heard of in my life. Yeah. And the fact that he is as sweet, as good as a daddy is, as funny as he is, all that shit. It's like, man... That's a person that you need to be like, he's going to say some naughty words. Well, yeah. He, I, one of his, my favorite tweets of his was like when, you know, Seth Simon or some fucking asshole was coming for him. And he yeah. was like, you know, my mom was the whore. My dad was a murderer or whatever it was. He's like, you should, you should be lucky that all I do is yeah, I think that's his, that I is think, my comedy. Okay. Yeah, I think that's his pin tweet. And it yeah. Right. That. Right. I mean, what, a, what a fucking warning label. <laughs> it's like, dude, that is, that's my only, we, like, you've we, always we, seen, you've always seen comics do like the, you know, caution tape around their mouth or like to let you know they're dangerous right that is louis J. Gomez is the only person who legitimately needs a warning label on him where you're like there it is i should have been this and now i'm this and he's <laughs> man he's a person where like i when people don't like him i'm like yeah if you only know him through the internet i, I definitely see I get, how you I get in the room with him for five minutes or on the phone with him for two minutes i'm like god damn i love this son of yeah, a he's a teddy bear he's a nice guy right right I love him I do you think him. that you are funnier because of like the loss you experienced like Hell that when yeah. i when I, like, yeah. that 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 uh inherent funniness though is that because like i can understand where you no i think it just makes you def i think it's like um you can have fast hands but then you can grow up like fucking manny pacquiao where your dad's making you fight in a wet market right right you're gonna get good you're yeah. gonna get fucking yeah. nice That's boxing. What I, mean. I think you would have been inherently funny just be like i think i would have like i said into my hbo special like i would have just been the funniest guy at enterprise right like, i would just be fucking I'd be at a low level marketing firm or designing action figures. I'd be doing some nerd shit right. and just kind of smoking a lot of weed and being like, eh, whatever. I'd probably Class clown. I would definitely joking. have a drinking problem because no one would interfere. Because right. it was my, my comedy career. People were like, you should probably fucking. Was that what it was? Like, if you stop drinking, you'll be better at this sort of thing? Yeah, hell yeah. And it was, uh, it was uh, a mixture of that and therapy. Like going to therapy and, and my therapist being like, yeah, you're an alcoholic. And you're like, shut up. No dork. way. Whatever, dork. You know like, that I, I'm I'm new to therapy. I'm trying to get get really into it. It's the and, brain gym, dude. It's the yeah. brain. And I sucks. and I think that a, a you know a lifetime and then a decade of it being a lifetime on the internet and a decade of it being my career and like grinding through it, fighting through everything is like a I'm just ready to fucking swing, yeah. you know. And I am like learning that, and I'm like, oh, this is a horrible way to be. Yeah. I have to undo all of that and rebuild it. And that sounds not fun. Fuck. Yeah, there. It's like, man, uh, Bobby Kelly has my favorite. Like, Bobby Kelly is one of the f the most important people in my life because he has always been. First off, just a fucking killer. If you ever are, if you're a comedian and you ever have to follow Robert Kelly, take a hike. You, yeah, <laughs> just walk it's out. him. I would probably go on my list of it'd be Bobby, Jessica, Kirsten, Greer, Barnes. It's just not fun. This is not fun to do stand up. Like you can do stand up after like Louie or Rock or Seinfeld, 
Because, like, you know, there's people there that are like, all right, I've seen him. Who's this guy? Right. But when you watch, like, Bobby wreck a room, you're just like, I had to follow him. And I came back from Edinburgh, and I worked the Cellar Vegas. And, I, you know, they have dispensaries there. So I just bought a ton of weed. And I was just, like, smoking in my hotel room. And then fucking Liz put me on after Bobby, who was running his Netflix Degenerate set. Dude, I was just like, at one point I was on stage and I was like, man, I am a placeholder right now. Yeah. <laughs> You're just on stage watching people not give a fuck about what you are saying. Because Bobby just fucking annihilated. All right, I, I get what you're saying. But again, knowing how, like how, I know how I view you. And yeah. I know there's a million other people who do. You're Dude. telling me you don't think that there's some level of like, you're just, you're, this is self-loathing. No, it's a, no, no, it's a physical actuality. It is you just a, don't believe it. Dude, I'm telling you right now, it's just a physical, there's no, I'm not trying to be humble in any fucking way. I'm letting you know it is a straight up A plus B equals C. It's just what it is. And Bobby's like, you know, Bobby does this like where he's like, what? what? Dude, my favorite is one time I saw him murder at the cellar back, like, I think it was when I was opening for him before I was passed. And he gets off stage and I was like, Jesus, Bobby. And he goes, I'm a fucking hammer. <laughs> and I was just like, God damn it. This is what I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm a fucking hammer. I'm like, you goddamn right you are. But he was the guy that came into my life and obviously I was like learning about him that he was the first one that's like, yeah, dude, you got to fucking take care of your mental health. Mm -hmm. Got a fucking therapy. And, you know, I go to the same therapist that him and a lot of other comedians use, but it was like, oh shit, man, this shit, it's like going to a, a trainer when you're an athlete. You're like, right. you got to stay got to keep your knees loose so you you think being a comic is is harsher on on the brain than the the average uh, career no job? no because i i do whenever anyone's like you guys go on stage and you do that i'm like dude opening a small business in a midwestern city that's a grind that's hard. that's a fucking grind but not it, going thursday through saturday to a, a sweet right. gig i agree with that but i just said this on this is the first episode of this show i was like Every time I talk about the, the struggles of, of this type of job, I always preface it with like, I know it's, I'm not, I'm not a coal miner, you know? Yeah. But in my mind, I think I'm like the internet coal miner where it's, I know it's not physically hard or whatever, but what I do is, is probably more like taxing on like your brain and your heart than the guy who can like just go to work and come home. And like, sure. and I think the comics have that as well, where it is probably more of a mental struggle than some jobs. I think younger in my career, I was way more harsh on myself about that just because, you know, if you work a couple of hard jobs, you know, it, even mm -hmm. in the restaurant industry, you right. fucking bust for a year. You're like, fuck this shit. I was very like, nah, I, I used to be tired when I worked at A, B or C, but now what I've realized is like, oh yeah, it's, it is like to do two headlining shows in a night on a Friday. It's you're fucking wiped afterwards. Like you're yes. like, I taped the HBO special and, um, I learned that I should never throw an after party. I'm not one of those guys. You like, want to just be done, right? God bless Chappelle and all those cool guys that can just fucking have, like I've been to like after parties where I'm like, this is awesome. And right. it's like, man, not for me, not for me. Like I did those two. And I think it was, uh, it was the mix of nerves and like getting the set ready for fucking 10 months and actually filming it. And then I was like, man, I just want to be done eat and get high and sit in a quiet room and like katie was katie was great about it she's like no 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 I'll, you know hang out enjoy this like take it in because she knew i'm bad at that and she's like take it in and i was like all right i'm trying to take it in okay can we go, <laughs> can we go, now? Can if, we go? i think if you make an effort you know if you yeah. tried and then it's like but no i'd rather just be back home i yeah, think that's why think... you kind of who are you, who you are too and that's what like why I think if you were the after party guy i don't know if your comedy would hit the same or you'd be as relatable or whatever it is yeah, but I think other people need to, like, outside of entertainment, realize that it's, like, give themselves a mental break. Be like, if you're fucking homeschooling your kid and you're working from home and you got all this going on, don't be fucking, don't feel weird for going to the basement and smoking a joint. Yeah, yeah. And like, a little bit of podcast. me time. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, like but, like, absolutely, like, don't, don't be so harsh on yourself. And I think that's what I've I've been working on it. That's something that like in a situation like this, that why I'm so glad I'm with Katie and, and who she is as a person. Cause she's just like, dude, you are fucking tough on yourself. And I'm like, yeah, because I've always been that way by myself and I've never had anybody really to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're, you're pushing the brake too hard. 100%. You're like wearing your brake pads out. And it's like, oh shit. 
because I think I, you know, I don't know. I think I would have never stopped to fix that had it not been for the pandemic. Really? You think it had that much of an impact? Because, of, yeah, because of perspective or just time? Like now I can't do Dude, I, I, I had, I was working every hour of every day that I was awake because I was under that impression of like, dude, this could go away. I don't know. I mean. always feel that way. I'm like, oh, this could go away. Let me go work. And I also love doing stand up. Mm -hmm. I love doing stand up and I love doing the bonfire because it's being funny. Again, billions, an unbelievable opportunity, an unbelievable opportunity. But I don't think once billions is done for me, you don't see me being like on the new stars power book three and it's right. like soda's playing a corrupt <laughs> detective it's going after 50 cent it's right. like uh, you know i don't it was know just kind what, of a, like a stars aligned it was a good thing yo, man awesome opportunity we got to learn how to act around some of the best actors going right now right it's like, man, what an opportunity. And I'm just going to shut the fuck up. And, and hopefully the next thing that one of my friends puts me in, I do a better job. <laughs> but it's like, man, because, you know, you, you have agents that you get into. Um, and I know this is like inside baseball, but you get like you, you get an agent, you get your agents and you get something like billions. And they're like, all right, what about this? Well, you want to do this? You want to do this? And you're like, yeah, but I have the funny bone that weekend. And then they're like, <laughs> Are you okay. serious, dude? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but dude, that's what it, you know, when you were asking like stand up, is that the thing? It's like, it always has been. It'll always thing. be the thing. Yeah. Everything I do, I hope feeds back to my stand up. That's all. That's truly always like me doing this podcast, me doing anything. It's like, go check out my hour special. Mm -hmm. Don't watch anything before that. I hate it all. Just <laughs> watch the HBO special. Everything before that, you shut up and then listen to the bonfire. <laughs> dude, so bonfire is, is it? You're going to uh, where are you going? You're going to. We don't know yet. We don't. We're still we're up here. Yeah, serious. So you're currently right now off the air. Yeah, we are. Comedy Central Radio ended all original programming, Just which not. is fucking. I mean, in, insane. I I can't. Yeah. Believe, but I, listen, I got, man, Comedy Central's done a lot of great things for me, including getting this show off the ground and letting Jay and I basically do whatever the fuck we have wanted for five years. Yeah. So I can't knock them for that. It is, but it's like watching your uh fucking like drug addict sibling just crash where you're like mm -hmm. stop chasing the money dude right. stop chasing the money you guys pushed away everyone that was making good shit for you i mean to be called comedy central and to be like operating the way they are but whatever. i hate to say i hate to say i called it but two years ago i said man this feels like mtv in the early aughts yeah they were just kind it. of like all right we're gonna stop playing music and here's a pregnant 16 year old uh totally alienate what? i'm looking forward to the animal documentaries on comedy central yeah <laughs> i mean it's nuts especially when they get something like the bonfire. Like I got a, a, I started getting tweets a couple of weeks ago being like, uh, go get dance, go get Soder and big J and bring them to the pirate ship at Barstool. And I almost, cause I didn't know what's going on. I almost wrote back like the bonfire is fucking raging hot. They don't need, they don't need our help yeah. or they don't need Barstool. And then I realized what was going on. And I was like, Oh my God, for, for that, for you guys to hit the free agent market is crazy in my mind. Yeah. Anybody letting that happen is a crime against comedy and the fact that it is comedy central let's say you were on some other network that wasn't comedy based and they were like yeah you guys got to go because we got to focus on sports or some shit yeah. i get it but to be comedy a comedy channel and to let soda and big j go is like it's like let's like the what the fucking indians just did with lindor trading them. Like, <laughs> yeah, when you crazy. gotta these when you got these kind of guys you gotta keep them yeah man it felt like um you know it, it i think it stung when we found out because we're yeah. like because they're going to keep going as a radio station. They're not like, it's not like 95 is turning into like, you know, La Caliente or something. It's like, with, fuck it. with, well, they're going to they're play all their old specials. You know, okay. Probably, so it's just not like talk anymore. It's not, yeah, there's not, talk. you know, uh, Nikki's show ended. And then, you know, I think they just like waited for our contract to be up to be like, yeah, Insane. we're not. Cause usually we just re up in December and then just, it would be no, we wouldn't even miss a beat. Yeah. But, you know, they kind of came to us and they were like, Hey, here's Comedy Central didn't even tell us. Sirius came to us and was like, "You guys are about to be free agents." And we were like, "No, we're not." Comedy Central loves us, and they're like, yeah. "No, they're they're not carrying you guys." And we we're like, "Uh, what's up?" And they hit us with that maybe like two weeks before we were off air, and wow. so then it's like, and then it's like, uh, yeah, be, but then what felt good about it was this, you know, get reached out to by you and you know, 
Yeah. Lewis, Lewis fucking really trying hard to get us there, which I understand why he wants us. And it makes sense. It's funny that when your friend talks shit about your radio show and then he's like, <laughs> no, come, come to our network. Yeah, yeah. You. But no, I had a great I told, I, to, So the fans know I texted Dan and I said, it sucks that it's happening right now. Cause I'm still a broke boy. But if I had my like barstool equity money, the very first thing I would, if I was off of my own, the very first thing I would do would offer both of you a number you cannot refuse. And I would go start like a new podcast or radio network with you two being like the cornerstones to start it. And it felt good like to have that, you know, get that text or like to have Lewis, like we had a long conversation where Lewis was like, dude, we could do this. This is feasible. This is blah, 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 blah. And I was yeah. like, man, you actually have put a lot of thought into this. Mm-hmm. And that was like kind of crazy. Cause it's just like, oh man, it's our silly radio show. It's just like the six. Oh, of it's so much. I would fucking- hit you with a blank check and say, go do whatever you want. Yeah. And, you know, I think we're getting really close to getting a deal right now from what I've heard from people and from what Jay and I have like Jay and I collecting information and then talking to each other. Mm-hmm. But it's um, it's just such a fun show that like, you know, billions might get someone on the street to be like, I know that guy. But Bonfire is going to like make my mom uh, grew up in Fresno and she flew back from Denver to Fresno for her like 50th high school reunion. And so she was flying. I think she flew to SFO and then drove or whatever. She's flying and these like two mid 20 year old couple, guy and girl, she ends up talking to them and they're like, oh, that's cool. And then the, by the end of the flight, she's like, yeah, you know, my son lives in New York. And they're like, oh, that's great. What does he do? And she's like, he's a comedian. I'm like, oh, what's his name? And like Dan Soder. And they're like, you're Trish the Dish. And my yeah. mom was like, what? My yep. mom's like, what? And they're like, we listen to the bonfire every day. And she's like, oh, fuck, yeah. And they're like, yeah. oh, man. And this is before my special. They're like, was Gary really a piece of shit? And she's like, ah, he's a good dude. You know, he gave me <laughs> Dan. And like, this is one of those situations where you're like, man, that is like. That's when the, the people it's cool that billions, you. It's, it's cool that people like recognize me for billions. But that's recognized. But when mm-hmm. people like listen to the bonfire, that's a different connection. And like seeing us go off the air, it's been like, you know pretty emotional seeing all these people be like dude what the fuck man you guys are supposed to be there for me and you're like we're trying yes, we want to be right. there we want to be w- there when i hear that it's like be there for me i'm like what are yeah. you guys talking about i just like talk about like i make dick jokes on a podcast yeah exactly but, but, you don't, but for you those realize people it helps are... with the boredom but yeah. again you can't take it too seriously right you have to know that's that the balance that's admit, that's what i hope they're going to figure out because sometimes yeah. I want to beat myself up over shit. Sometimes I want to, I take it. I'm like, this is not the end of the world. Sometimes I'm like, it is pretty important. It is yeah. pretty cool what I did, but it's not that cool. I, it's, it's this balancing act with everything. Yeah. It's man. I don't know. We're all figuring shit out right now. And it is hard. It is hard to sit with yourself and be like, Oh, I do do that. And it sucks. And I need to change. And it's like, it takes a fucking it, it takes some strength to do that. And, right. and and I understand people that are, you know, I'm trying to get back in shape because I've just been fucking eating and, you know, wearing sweatpants. And I realize the doors are going to open back up and they be like, dude, Soda's in a fat suit. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you I, know, pe- people know that in order to get your body ripped, it's a it's an impossible like task to get done at the gym, Sure, but they, but they think to get your mind right, that it's just a matter of like, Oh, I just got to like, you know, think I just need to follow an inspirational Instagram. It's <laughs> right, like, quotes. Oh, you don't. You, you, no, you have to work as hard on your brain as you would on your fucking yeah. abs. And but then you, you start oh. seeing it, man. Like I've kept therapy going through this. And I think that's the reason that and mixed with Katie is the reason I haven't drank again, you know, cause this has been, how long you been sober? Fuck man. March 8th will be, eight years wow yeah i quit 2013 march like 8th 2013 do you feel like you're always like one not to like are you do you always want it every day and you're fighting it back or are you like cigarettes yes alcohol sometimes yeah i was just talking about this on are you garbage i miss liquor stores i don't miss bars (laughs) interesting Bars like are for that. bars That's are for people. Yeah, bars are for people that feel cool. Liquor stores are people that want to get stuff done. Yeah, <laughs> I ain't here to fucking. I'm not here to fucking stand at the bar and look cool sipping a Coronita. I need a fucking bottle of Three Rows and a six pack of Rolling Rock. Let's get yeah, the fucking work. Right, all right. I want, I want you, I want you to slip that little cardboard in between the two yeah. bottles I'm buying in that black bag, and let's go to Dude, fucking. I'm work. You, if by my booze purchases, you'd be like, this guy is solving cases. <laughs> this guy's, this guy's in an old Accord, fucking solving murder cases. Just taking nips of three rows. <laughs> I love it, dude, man. Uh, your perspective is always an important one. I feel like 
uh, I look up to you in a lot of ways, and I feel like you really are one of the funniest fucking people. Oh, so man, I, I I'll tell you, man, you you know, um, for all the like the shit that Barstool catches whenever it does, I've always been like, man, I don't know them as a company. I just know KFC, and he's fucking been great to me. Yeah. You guys, you guys were always so fun, man. I remember one time I went to go do your guys's podcast, and I was so fucking high, <laughs> and I, your guys' open workspace was a panic attack. Because the, the I, elevator opens up and you just walk out into damn, it. Yeah. Damn. And I just went and sat in the corner drinking coffee. And I remember you came over and you're like, all right. And I was like, yeah, what's up? Okay. Yeah, but like, then you fucking murdered it. That was when I was like, oh, my God, it's oh. one of the funniest guys I've ever come across. So. Oh, man, but I appreciate it. And I always have, you know, appreciated you put me on and uh, let me fucking advertise whatever I got going on. So Speaking of, yeah. what is, so so Bonfire currently on hiatus, but soon. We'll be back. We're, we're going to be back yeah. sooner than later. And then, uh, you know, if you got HBO Max, check out my special Son of a Gary. Gary you can so check good. out Colin Quinn and Friends driving a uh, comedy show that we did back in September or August. I forget when we fucking did it, but it's fun. It's all my, some of my favorite human beings on the planet. Actually, everyone on that lineup is fucking great. Yeah, I love is, every single awesome. person on that lineup, and that's hard to say in comedy. But every single person on that lineup, I, I fuck with, and I love. You know, you got Colin, Bobby, Keith, got yep. all the, the classic hitters, man. And the, and the fact, I mean, you're a part of that for a reason, dude. So don't. Yeah, forget. Chrissy D. The Chrissy D. And I wore the same fucking t-shirt. And <laughs> just looked like two young idiots out of that group. We looked like the security. Fucking. <laughs> All right, man. So every and you know, go follow Matt Dan Soder. Be on the lookout for the announcement for Bonfire. Whatever it is, you should subscribe to it, pay for it, buy it, whatever it is, because it's uh, you and Jay together are. I mean, that's uh, man, Doctor Malone type shit, dude. You guys. It's are a right it's coming. a it's a lucky situation, and and I'm definitely John Stockton, and I'm gonna find out if if Jay has any 13 year old brides. I gotta <laughs> find that out right now. I love it, man. Appreciate uh, like over an hour here. That's awesome, man. I really thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, of course, man. All right, dude. dude. Great fucking catching up and, and congratulations to your Mets. That's so funny, dude. I just looked at my phone and the wrestling thread with Ch- Che and Jermaine is fucking popping blown. off. Is yeah, there big, is there big news? Anything happening? Um, I'm no, there was watching old WWF. That's even better. It's like nothing the, the when the wrestling chain can pop off when nothing's even going on because you're just like, Yeah, you see the Royal Rumble in '97. It's amazing. Oh, yeah, dude. That's exactly what he just texted me. He yeah. wrote 2001 Royal Rumble, so damn good. <laughs> No, there's no type of friendship like a wrestling friendship i swear it's the, it's the dorkiest i love it all right man stay in touch and uh tell katie i said hi and uh yeah, absolutely man thanks for having me buddy. Later, have a good soon, one man. peace